How are you doing? Once again, we're here with Biology 230, Cell and Genetic Biology. Uh, today we're going to talk about photosynthesis. So let's go ahead and get started. So to understand the light dependent and independent reaction, you also have to understand the electromagnetic spectrum. That is basically all the energy being released from the sun. There are several types. You have gamma rays, x-rays, UV, uh, visible, uh, infrared, microwaves, radio waves. We actually tend to use a lot of these uh, forms of radiation. We actually use this in a lot of experimental processes. Um, if you've ever been to the dentist, the way they actually look at your internal structures or your teeth without cutting you open, x-ray. If you ever had a broken limb, x-ray to look at your internal structures without cutting you open. UV radiation, uh, we actually use this for sterilization. We've actually uh, utilized this to actually help kill microbes in the environment because this will actually degrade a lot of DNA forms, uh, lipid, and protein. Uh, visible light, this is what our eyes are sensitive to. This is the information our biological system takes in to actually tell you what you're actually seeing or what's presented it before you. Uh, infrared, we use this in a lot of remote controls to actually send signals across a space. Microwaves, we can use this for remote control as well. Your cell phone operates on this. Um, we also use this to heat up our food. Radio waves, uh, use this for communication. Uh, a lot of radio waves are sending out various forms of communication where you're talking about um, a walkie-talkie or a actual radio station playing music. So the main thing we're concerned about is visible light. This is what is mainly utilized for photosynthesis. This is the information our eyes mainly takes in. So, uh, visible light is mainly between 380 and 750 nanometers of light. This may fluctuate a little bit, um, maybe all the way down to the 370 range to the 760 range, depending on the organism itself. To take advantage of this range of light, um, you have several pigments in photosynthetic organisms that allow for the capture or the harness of that visible light. Here you have chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and carotenoids. Depending on the organism, you have a, a, a mixture of these pigments, and that mixture may vary depending on the organism as well. So no one or multiple organisms will have the same combination of these pigments for photosynthesis. Now, why do you need so many? If you actually look just at chlorophyll A, it's not very efficient. It's not very efficient at absorbing all this visible light. It has a couple of gaps right here, and it falls off right here too. Now, chlorophyll B actually picks up the slack where chlorophyll A falls off. It actually will absorb some of that energy being emitted somewhere between this 450 range and the 500 range, where the chlorophyll A is actually falling off. Then you have the carotenoid, which will actually pick it up a little bit more around that 500 range, which chlorophyll A and B are slacking off too. Um, then you have chlorophyll A and B working together to try to capture some of that energy right here. Uh, regardless, none of these pigments will be 100% efficient at absorbing all the energy. And that's the same for energy transfer on a universal scale. When you go from one energy form from another, um, it's never 100% efficient. Whether it's the capture mechanism or the conversion mechanism, you'll lose some of that energy somewhere in some shape, form, or fashion. Now, when that actually happens, you also see... Um, the photosynthesis rate picking up around those same areas okay and that's what is depicted right here in that experiment we talked about earlier uh, if you know photosynthesis is going on how do you measure it well you can measure it by the energy molecules being produced uh, but a very easy way to do it is measure it by the oxygen being produced and in this case we introduce photosynthetic organisms with oxygen loving organisms and basically you saw the oxygen production or you assume the oxygen production is picking up in this area in this area based upon the increase in productivity 
an increase of the population of bacteria in this area, in this area. So, when photosynthetic organisms harness energy from the sun in the form of a photon, basically what it does is causes that photolysis or hydrolysis. That's very important, not only because it releases that hydrogen ion, but it also releases electrons. The electrons have the negative charge. They're unstable. They don't want to really sit around too long. They keep bouncing from structure to structure or molecule to molecule in photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 um, trying to look for a home, trying to look for something to actually bond to. So they'll keep bouncing around from structure to structure to structure to structure until they hit a photo donating molecule which sends it up to a photo acceptor or electron donating molecule sends it up to an electron acceptor. The electron acceptor in turn will actually allow for that electron to be utilized to actually form ATP. When that basically happens, the energy is stored in the universal cellular energy form such as ATP. And then basically that happens again. Uh, the electrons are excited and they eventually get to the electron donating molecule which will cause it to be accepted by the electron acceptor and then it will be used to form additional energy molecules. So once again uh, energy from the sun captured in the form of a photon. Um, the chlorophyll molecules also referred to as photosystem 1 and 2 basically allow for the photolysis or hydrolysis. The electron keeps bouncing around in the structures within this molecule until eventually it hits that electron donating molecule and then basically it'll be elevated in energy to be accepted and form ATP. Then uh, that energy is stored to use for later. Here's an example of that energy because the fluorescence occurring here is based upon the energy uh, being captured and being shot around from the electron in this particular case. So that's how a lot of times you have fluorescent molecules actually fluorescing themselves. In summary, uh, you have your light-dependent, light-independent reaction. In the light-dependent reaction, uh, which is utilizing the water and producing the oxygen gas, you're actually forming your ATP, universal cellular energy form, and your hydrogen donating structure, NADPH. Uh, these two structures are actually used in the light-independent reaction to keep this uh, cycle going, this reaction going. Um, in this reaction, you also utilize the carbon dioxide um, to basically build to the carbon structures already present in the cycle to actually form your glucose. Now, once you actually have your glucose formed, you can actually use it to make either sucrose, starch, or cellulose. Now, the sucrose is used to transport energy throughout the entire uh, system. If it's a multi-cell structure, like a plant, it transports energy to all the cells of the root, the shoot system, and then it takes it down to the root system. Uh, so that way all the cells are fed, even those that are not engaging in photosynthesis. Uh, some of the energy is stored immediately in those locations for later, uh, simply because there might be a time when uh, available light is low. So therefore you cannot engage in photosynthesis, uh, so you want to have some energy stores. A perfect example is the winter time. Uh, a lot of plants mainly live off of the energy stores in the winter when uh, the amount of light is low um, simply because there's not a whole lot of available water because the, the water is frozen in the form of ice. And you need the water to actually produce these two molecules to actually allow for this thing to actually activate. Um, then you have cellulose, which is this cellular structure. Uh, this actually protects the cell keeps it rigid um, so it prevents physical d damage or trauma to the actual cells itself. As a byproduct of this reaction you'll actually have the water production. Uh, so you have the oxygen gas being produced and the water being produced. Okay, have a good day. So here's an example of a good day. Um, you actually have a satellite image of photosynthesis occurring. So, can anybody guess what this is right here in the black? Right here. That's right, it's Florida. This is the northern United States. Well, hmm, why is it black? 
This is an example of photosynthesis. This is Florida. We're around this area. Why is this black? I don't understand. What's going on? Well, because we know that certain entities engage in photosynthesis, and we know the combination of pigments, we could actually calibrate imaging devices to actually pick up the photosynthesis of certain organisms based upon their fluorescence. Um, so, in this particular case, we actually have the Atlantic Ocean. So, the dark areas are very little to no photosynthetic activity, and the bright red and yellow areas are a lot of photosynthetic activity. So, we have black here because this imaging device has been calibrated to basically only pick up the photosynthetic activity of algae um, in the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. So that's the reason why you have the area which you know has photosynthetic organisms present is entirely black with no photosynthetic activity because this device has been calibrated to basically pick up photosynthesis based upon the fluorescence of these organisms only. So this is great because if you want to do some kind of research on these organisms, you can actually do the same thing. Calibrate your imaging device specifically for uh, the type of organism you're looking for. But first, you have to study it first and figure out the fluorescence and the pigment concentration so you know how to calibrate it. Okay? That is it.